So we're going to talk about um, the FDA's road to aducanumab, uh, the decision. Actually, we're not going to talk in detail about that decision itself. We are going to, I am going to talk about what it was and, and some of the um, little bit of the aftermath. Uh, but really, the focus is going to be how could we have come to that place? And part of that story is actually going to be a, a research project that I started uh, with a postdoc several years ago and that uh, by some measure failed. So we're going to be talking about a failed study that, that gave some insights and, and uh, you'll see what I mean by that. So uh, this is entitled Regulatory Memory Loss and you'll also see by the end what I mean by that. So let's get right into it. Um, this is the uh, statistical review uh, for aducanumab uh, in the uh, uh, advisory committee hearing that was held in um, uh, November of uh, 2020 uh, for Alzheimer's. And this is the summary. And I'm not going to spend too much time on this. And the advisory committee was one that uh, Aaron Kesselheim was a member of, so he knows this extremely well. And what you'll see in this summary, and I'll just translate it for you, is about as uh, critical a, a summary as you're ever going to get from the biostat uh, group at the FDA. Uh, they noted that both of the phase three trials that were in support of aducanumab, which is, a, I should say, is a monoclonal antibody uh, designed to slow the progression of uh, two Alzheimer's or in subjects with mild Alzheimer's, uh, and they note that the two main trials were stopped for futility. That is stopped because they were thought to uh, I indicate that, the, that they didn't work. There was a small uh, safety study, um, which uh, it was felt did not contribute to, uh, to uh, any conclusions about efficacy. And this highly technical uh, sentence basically says that the cognitive changes, this is a cognitive score, doesn't uh, correlate with the what are seen as the amyloid, uh, the imaging uh, changes. And finally, lack of substantial evidence, no replication, highly conflicting results in two studies, conflicting subgroups, and very poor long-term safety data. Um, this is just the biostat group. Perhaps uh, more um, damning is the, uh, the final vote of the committee, which is now well known. Um, and this is the final summary minutes, and here's the vote. This is the summary uh, 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 question put before the committee in light of the understanding provided by the exploratory analysis of study 301 and, I can't read the edge, and, and 302, along with the results of study 103. So these are the three studies that they were considering and evidence of pharmacodynamic effect on Alzheimer's disease pathophysiology, uh, which is uh, on the amyloid. Is it reasonable to consider study 302 as a primary evidence of effectiveness of aducanumab for the treatment of Alzheimer's? And here you see the votes, which uh, <clears throat> uh, yes, zero, no, 10, uncertain, one. Um, and you don't get more definitive votes from advisory committees than this. And the committee discussion, almost all of the committee members voted no. Uh, agreeing that it's not reasonable to consider study 302 as primary evidence of effectiveness. These members were not persuaded by the analyses provided and expressed their reluctancy to suggest approval of aducanumab for the treatment of Alzheimer's due to the insubstantial evidence shown. In addition, these members expressed the difficulty for them to draw a conclusion on the information provided due to unaddressed criticisms provided by the statistical analysis of the studies. So that's actually, the as far as I'm going to go, in the analysis of the evidence base here, but I'm just going to show you the um, the media coverage over the ensuing year. So that's November 2020, and Stat was all over this. Expert panel votes down Biogen's Alzheimer's drug and rebukes the FDA in the process. So that's very very unusual uh, as a headline and for an advisory committee. And Time just a few days later, the most promising Alzheimer's drug in years took a thrashing from an FDA advisory committee. Okay, so let's just move forward. So processes ensue, seven months later, what do we get? Headline, New York Times, June 7th, 2021, FDA approves Alzheimer's drug despite fierce debate over whether it works. 
um, and it comments on the dispute. This is page uh, A1. The next day is the first page of the business section. Alzheimer's drug is a bonanza for Biogen, most likely at taxpayer expense. Uh, this is a, a website that uh, uses more colorful language. Uh, FDA's intellectually insulting aducanumab decision opens up a regulatory foothold for leading competitors. The important thing here is that it points out what the implications are of this for many other similar drugs that might uh, purport to use the same mechanism, a mechanism that was not proven in this, uh, which is the, the, uh, the amyloid hypothesis that reduction of amyloid can result in clinical benefit. So I'm just going to track the New York Times because it's consistent and it comes up. Uh, three days later, Aaron and two of his colleagues resigned from this committee. And uh, five days later, penned this uh, 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 opinion piece about the despairing about the uh, how low the evidential bar had had been lowered in this decision and the implication for future decisions at the FDA. Um, a few days later, another headline saying because it was originally approved for all Alzheimer's, uh, Alzheimer's patients and not just those with mild Alzheimer's, saying that it should at least be restricted to those in whom it was tested. Here's new drug could cost the government as much as it spends on NASA. Um, a little bit of uh, uh, pushback from the other side, which is that this gives some degree of hope to those with Alzheimer's. Of course, the question is, we get hope from ivermectin and hydrochloroquine for uh, COVID, uh, is, is that worth taking? Uh, July 7th, more, drug offers more questions than answers. And then this is actually one of my favorite. Just a month later, FDA seeks investigation of its own drug approval process. Now, this sort of <laughs> blows my mind. Uh, presumably they know, but um, we won't go into that right now. I'm just going to show you the headlines. Then the shoes start to drop. Cleveland Clinic and Mount Sinai won't administer adjuhelm to patients. So we start to get pushback from providers. And then there's this analysis of exactly how it did get approved. So, and here's a quote from that. Um, this approval shouldn't, shouldn't have happened, said Dr. Vicia Villetta. It defeats everything I believe in scientifically and it lowers the rigor of regulatory uh, bodies. Because of that, I felt very deflated personally. Now, who among you knows who Dr. Vicia Villeta is? She, uh, is she a pharma critic? Is she someone who sits and um, says that the, uh, the uh, FDA should bar the door to all new drugs? No, I will show you. She's the former Biogen senior medical director who helped design those two studies. And she said because of that, that's why she felt deflated personally. He says, this is not the reason, this is not the reason why my team and I did the work we did designing the study. So this is senior medical director, the designer of the studies, extremely uh, distressed that an approval could have been based on these results. And of course, that's the group that stopped these studies because they showed no effect. Then we have the house investigated and sales were rather uh, uh, disappointing. Uh, $300,000, this was a now priced at the time at a $56,000 drug. So if, if you did that division, that's six patients, but I'm sure that's not how it goes. Uh, unlikely to win EU approval, this is in, in November. A few days later, concerns about safety after the death of a patient who got the drug. It says 41% of patients in key clinical trials experienced brain, brain bleeding or swelling. Although uh, in many cases, this was asymptomatic. Not surprisingly in December, the, the price was halved. Uh, I'm sure it had nothing to do with the fact that CMS, Medicaid and Medicare were at that very time trying to decide whether they would pay for, uh, um, for the drug at the budget of uh, uh, NASA. And that was at the end of December, just less than a month ago. This is the decision that finally came out just two weeks ago. Um, you'll notice the comment uh, button here, and I'm going to end this talk, I'll warn you, by <laughs> urging you all to comment. Uh, this made the front page of the New York Times just two weeks ago, uh, and what they decided was uh, in a really, I, I don't know if it was a surprising decision, but one that they, a position they rarely take, which is to restrict their coverage it, under the, using the model of coverage under evidence development. That is that 
only if uh, for patients who would enroll in a clinical trial that would confirm the clinical benefit or would test the clinical benefit of the drug, would they cover it? And they wouldn't cover it for just routine administration. And, and this is a huge step uh, for them to take. This is the inside page, a uh, big story. Here's some quotes, the rationale for the decision. Lee Fleischer, I have to, sorry, the images here, here. A director of the Center for Clinical Standards, which issued this decision, said that the evidence showed that, quote, while there may be uh, potential for promise with this treatment, there's also potential for serious harm. Um, it may include headaches, dizziness, falls, brain leads. Our foremost goal is to protect uh, beneficiaries from potential harm uh, from an intervention without known benefits. As a practicing physician, I cannot overemphasize the need to understand the risks and benefits of a given treatment. He acknowledged the unusual nature of the decision, said that CMS is using its authority provided by Congress to determine if the drug is considered reasonable and necessary. So this is the statutory language that governs CMS. And as we will see, it is different than the statutory language that uh, governs FDA. Uh, and he goes on, meaning that the benefits of improvement of cognition outweigh the harms in the Medicare uh, population. So this was uh, commented on in a, in a piece uh, by Sean Tunis, who was actually uh, uh, Dr. Fleischer's predecessor in that same position at the FDA that just appeared yesterday on the Health Affairs blog. And they made uh, uh, these comments. Uh, CMS concludes that there's no trial of uh, an anti-amyloid uh, monoclonal antibody. Uh, let me just say, uh, and they, they point out the reasonable and necessary standard uh, in the Social Security Act. The FDA requires, and we'll be talking more about this, a determination that the product has an effect on a surrogate endpoint that is reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. Um, in the case of aducanumab, uh, strong pushback from the FDA advisors and many people on the outside um, suggested that the evidence does not support that reasonable likely, uh, reasonably likely standard. And this goes on to point out the, the difference, the gap between the FDA and CMS rationale, but there's a lot of complications here, which I won't go into, but it's, it's a very interesting piece. And of course, there are a few other things going on at the same time. Uh, we still don't have permanent FDA commissioner, at least at this time we did not. Um, so now we're gonna explore, explore how did we get here? I mean, it's clear that this is a bit of a mess. And uh, this is a, a little illustration of uh, somebody pretty lost in the woods. And uh, we have FDA in the back of the jacket. It's pretty self-explanatory. So how did we get here? So let's, I'm going to do a very, very brief summary of the regulatory framework under which FDA, that has been evolving over the last uh, 60 years that the FDA operates under. So in 1962, the Kefauver Harris Amendment uh, required that drug products be uh, judged as safe and effective, and it required substantial evidence of effectiveness. This word substantial evidence will appear and reappear and reappear. How is it operationally defined? At the time, evidence consisting of adequate and well-controlled investigations, that S is very important, including clinical investigations by experts qualified by scientific training. I'm not going to read through the whole thing, but this had implications. It was actually only fully operationalized in guidances in the early 70s. This is the de definition of what was meant by adequate and well-controlled investigations, clear statement of study objectives, valid comparison with control, and a lot of things that we take for granted in good clinical trials, a detailed protocol. And most importantly, at that time, uh, two two pivotal studies. So this is the, the famous two studies rule that the FDA depended on for a while, but not as long as most people would think. And I'm gonna talk about this only briefly, but it, it, it has a lot of relevance. So what are some of the features of this two pivotal trials rule? And what, when we say two pivotal trials, we mean two statistically significant pivotal trials. It's operationally pretty clear 
Um, the attempt is to try to minimize the probability of false positives, both through the significance and not depending on a particular study which might be biased in conduct or design. Uh, interestingly, the rule does not specify the denominator or, or that is how many studies were done. This is, doesn't say two out of how many, just two, or in fact that all the studies uh, be reported. So the FDA doesn't necessarily even know how many studies uh, were done that contributed to that too. And most importantly for me as an epidemiologist and biostatistician, it's a kooky rule uh, that's, that doesn't accord with modern or even barely at the time thinking about how to summarize evidence. It's an, actually an illegitimate form of meta-analysis, a form of vote counting. We're not going to, I, I want to point out, we're not going to spend our time on the two trial rule today. We're actually going to spend much more time on what happens when you only have one study or even less than one study to depend on. But, but I just can't resist this because it shows some of the problems with the logic of even clear rules. So this would be an example if we had four rule, four studies. Here's the null, uh, the, 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 the line of no effect. Here's the confidence intervals. We have one study that's statistically significant here. But as we all know, these could add up through a meta-analysis to a highly significant uh, effect, which is represented by this di diamond. But the vote count is only one, and therefore this would be judged to be not approvable, where this, where we could have two non-significant studies and two significant ones, has a vote count of two, even though the meta-analytic summary is, is not significant. And, and the, the summary on the right would be judged to have more evidence, stronger evidence than the one on the left. So this is just in the statistical realm. So there, there are many problems with this. Again, we're not going to spend much more time on it. But one reason, one issue is there's no formalism about the degree of evidence or, or statistical evidence or certainty required in different situations and no principled way to calibrate it. It incentivizes a lot of the things that we bemoan about the regulatory game, which is gaming, evidence suppression, and outcome switching, because you have this thresholding where only the studies that pass the magic threshold of P of less than 0.05 count. Um, now you might say, well, how, you know, how often do these sorts of things actually happen? Well, one of the most uh, influential meta-analyses ever, ever done back in 1988, which was tamoxifen and early breast cancer, most people don't realize that the 23 studies that were summarized, only one of them was significant. So if you use the two trial rule for this, for the effect of tamoxifen, which whose meta analytic effect was a 20% mortality reduction in breast cancer with a P of less than one in a billion, this would not pass muster by the two trial rule. So this is not a, just a theoretical issue. And of course, there's the American Statistical Association, which in its, in its statement a few years ago said, uh, bemoaned the use of statistical significance as a, as a means to decide on important policy or scientific decisions and said we shouldn't do that. So that's just all as background. So now let's get into the real meat of the issue, which is that regulatory pathways and evidential standards have, have evolved over the, the past 30 years. And there's a sense that there are situations in which we need to, I will say, weaken the, um, the, the desired uh, amount of evidence and this has been done through a whole series of amendments and uh, legislation that have given different pathways and different standards for uh, evidential uh, for for evidential uh, adjudication so the orphan drug designation actually is not what we would call an expedited pathway but it was an incentive program for um, uh, uh, it's an incentive program uh, for companies to test drugs that are designed for very uh, for less than 200,000 persons in the US. But then we have a whole series of what we call expedited um, pathways, uh, fast track, and this is in 1987, accelerated approval, priority review, breakthrough therapy. I'm not going to define each of the, but I, these, but I do want to I do want to uh, single out accelerated approval. Because technically speaking, accelerated approval is the only one 
is the only one that modifies the substantial evidence standard. Because what it says is that the approval can be based on a surrogate or intermediate clinical endpoint, endpoint and as I said before, that um, is reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. Almost all the others simply speed things up, but they don't formally lower the evidential standard. The other aspect of accelerator approval, which is quite interesting, and is that it's actually not something that the company applies for. It's a criteria that the FDA can use. So the FDA is the one who, who applies it, although I'm sure it might come out of conversations with the company. The other pathways are ones that the generally the company ap applies for. So accelerated approval, which was the, the designation and the pathway under which aducanumab was approved, which typically requires a, additional evidence after the approval, it's sort of a provisional approval, um, is very, it, it's very different than the others. Okay. So this is, comes right out of Aaron Kesselheim's uh, recent piece that shows all the legislation that has weighed into the modifications of these uh, both evidential and also safety assessment. It's a really, really nice piece in JAMA. And, um, and, but there have been lots and lots and lots of other pieces that have over the past 10 years that have looked at the use of these various pathways and how it's affected the um, uh, the kinds of uh, evidence that that's used for approval, and this is a summary in Aaron's piece uh, in JAMA. In, uh, in orphan, the orphan drug designation has gone from eighteen percent uh, in the uh, in in the mid nineties to forty one percent today. Use of the expedited pathways, which we just talked about now accounts for 81% of new drugs in 2018. The, the use of two trials to support approval has gone from 81% in the mid 90s to just about half of approvals uh, today. Approval after just one review cycle has gone from 77% to 90% today. The use of single arm trials, mainly, uh, which tends to happen mainly in oncology, has gone from only 4% in the mid 90s uh, to 17% closer to today. And somewhat longer trials has gone from uh, 26%, so that's good uh, in general, 26% in the mid 90s to 46% uh, today. So all of these, many of these um, sort of modifications were sort of rolled up in this guidance document from 2019. And these are, uh, these are again, uh, modifications that have occurred over the course of 20 years. And let me summarize uh, or use their summary of the conditions under which you could deviate from the two trial requirement. So one would be if that one trial was a large multi-center trial, uh, if there was evidence from related indications, if there was strong mechanistic support, if there was an established natural history, if there was evidence from a similar uh, drug class, uh, if there's a situation of serious outcomes with unmet net medical needs, that is no treatment for a very dire disease, uh, very rare diseases in which it's actually hard to get uh, more than one trial or one large trial or, or rare disease subsets, and finally where a efficacy trial might be unethical. What's interesting within the guidance is that what they're looking for is one trial plus additional evidence plus additional evidence, but this can come in many, many forms. But when you actually look for the operationalization of that evidence, you find a lot of adjectives whose meaning is uncertain. For example, if there is a persuasive statistical effect, if the results are strongly positive, if the statistical effect is robust, if the statistical evidence is inconsistent, if, <clears throat> if there are compelling efficacy results, they talk about strength of evidence, but without a way of defining it. If efficacy could be fairly and responsibly concluded by experts, um, in all cases, the FDA must conclude that there's substantial evidence, as I pointed out today before. However, the degree of certainty supporting such a conclusion may differ depending on clinical circumstances. So that's really interesting. Uh, first of all, there's no definition or quantitative measure of certainty. 
But what they're saying is they will use substantial evidence, but it, it might apply to completely different fact patterns depending on if it's a rare disease, if it's a dire disease, what the alternatives are. But they, all, they must use the word substantial evidence except with accelerated approvals. And finally, uh, a typical criterion for concluding that a trial is positive is a P less than 0.05. A lower p-value, for example, would be expected for uh, reliance on a single trial, so they'd want to get more significant uh, results. But for a serious disease with no available therapy or a rare disease, a somewhat higher p-value, if pre-specified and appropriately justified, might be acceptable. But they don't give much guidance as to what that number might be or exactly how you adjust it. So this is actually where our somewhat failed project came in. And this was the title of it. It was actually through the Searcy mechanism, which is the, um, uh, the, the Centers for Excellence in, Re in Regulatory Science. And these are scattered around the, the country and they're funded by the FDA. And the project we did uh, was indeed funded by the FDA and done in collaboration with FDA employees. Uh, and this is my postdoc, Perrine Genio, who did the heavy lifting on this. And we had this idea that maybe what we could do is develop a formal evidence score. That is take all these elements and help the FDA, both help us understand how these, all these different factors played into decisions and use it both as maybe a normative, but at least as a descriptive way to bring order to the chaos because it's very, very difficult to read through these decisions and sort of figure out how much weight do these various things get. So here's just a sort of heuristic uh, upon which we based our score. So first of all, uh, the, it comes in two categories. One is the, the strength of evidence from the evidence you have in hand. So if it's a large multi-center RCT, that's a positive. If there's a uh, v validate, actually, the, if it's observational, that's negative. If it uses a surrogate endpoint, that's negative. And if it uses short-term outcomes, that is negative. Um, but then there's another issue, which is the, the bar. That is, how certain do you have to be? This goes to the strength of the evidence. This on the bottom goes to how certain do you have to be? How much evidence do you need? So if it's an orphan disease without an alternative, you have a lower bar, a breakthrough drug, you would have a, a lower bar. That is a huge effect. A serious condition, a lower bar. A Me Too drug with alternatives, a higher bar. And if there's a safety concern, a higher bar. So we built this uh, score based on a, a Bayesian backbone on a quant log odd scale. I'm not going to go into too much detail because I don't want it to get distracted by this. Um, because it was as it was sort of, I would call it semi, it was quantitative but it was used in a semi, in a quantitative and qualitative way. Additive elements corresponded to different desired thresholds and multiplicative downweighting due, due to weak design or conduct was used to effectively reduce the, uh, the sample, the effective sample size of, of uh, evidence presented. So this was the basic structure of the score. And this was our strategy to take a score apply it to cases above and below the FDA's approval threshold, and then calibrate the score coefficients to discriminate between approvals and disapprovals. This would reveal, in theory, the implicit weighting that FDA gives to the various elements of, uh, uh, of, of judgment that it asks people to use when they're not using the two, the two study rule, and it would provide both a normative and a descriptive net, uh, metric. But there's a problem. FDA releases no information about unapproved drugs, at least not formally, including their names. So in theory, we only had a sample of, of approval, so we never knew what fell below. So we decided to study a sample of drugs that were initially disapproved, but eventually approved. So we would have a longitudinal study of where every single uh, drug was turned down and then with additional evidence or, uh, or, or different additional considerations, it would then be approved. And this would guarantee it's like a, like, it's like a crossover study, sort of one way crossover. Uh, 
uh, it guaranteed that all the confounders, all the contextual elements would remain constant. So this would really shine a bright light on the evidence. And we would only use cases where the evidence of efficacy is in question. That is, we took out ones where safety was a big issue. That's because efficacy is what is defined by statute and safety needs to be in balance. And we really wanted to get this to be a, a, an evidence score for efficacy. So we looked at this period because we started this in 2018. We found 22 cases, uh, 17 in drugs, five biologics, and we looked at everything. We looked deeply into the reasoning that was used across all the cycles. And we also applied this score. So we did not just do summaries of, uh, uh, of evidence features. We looked at the actual logic that was used by the, by the FDA reviewers. And this is just an example of how we applied it in one case, a perfenidone for idiopathic uh, pulmonary fibrosis. And I'm gonna do this really quickly. So this is the first cycle and we had, so it always starts with an, a statistical component, which is basically based on a meta-analytic p-value. So we didn't use the score, that thresholding. And we converted that into, into actually uh, the effectively a, 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 a maximum a, a base factor. We gave points for being randomized, for the endpoint being measured at suitably long um, uh, interval. Uh, the, there was a surrogate, so that was a negative that it was a life-threatening disease and an orphan, and it was an orphan drug, so that was uh, sort of lowered the threshold, but the mechanism of action was not well established. Cycle one, there was only one uh, study that was statistically significant, unclear clinical rele relevancy, and they asked for uh, a, um, a second study, and so a, a, a complete response letter was issued. That complete, that second study was done, this added dramatically to the evidence score and to give you a, to, to calibrate this, a, a, a value of six would be basically one statistically significant study. Um, so the, the evidence score had a contribution of 15 from the statistical component. And then we had these other additions and um, this was approved. So this was approved. And we did a few of these and we got the score going, you know, from the initial approval, I'm sorry, disapproval uh, up to the approval and everything looked like it was moving in the right direction. Um, and we thought that it provided a transparent reporting template that helps communicate consistently the basis for the decisions, but also left a substantial role for judgment. That is about safety, about effect importance, making it hard to gain. We purposely left things out because we, if the problem is if you have a formula, the formula will be gamed and it will cease to have meaning. So we purposely left things out. So this looked sort of okay, but actually not so much. So let's, let's think hard about this. What you have here is a drug, and this is uh, Tolvaptin, it used in the polycystic kidney disease with a very, very, very high score to start. The question was, well, why wasn't that approved? because these things were approved with scores below it. And similarly, you have, the, you have final scores here or here, that's way below scores that were um, disapproved there. So there was a calibration problem here. So we thought, okay, we'll just work on the calibration and, and we'll fix this so we could have something that's vaguely normative. And I'm just gonna jump to the, um, jump to the, uh, to the end and these are our 22 cases and immediately what you see is first of all a large number the score did not change at all over multiple cycles so these are the cycles of review number one everything is it turned down number two number three for a few of them and number four how could the score go down you might wonder well it took so long that that there were alternative treatments so they lost that benefit of having no alternative treatment. So that actually that lowered their score. But you see a large number barely budge. You see this continued um, uh, heterogeneity at baseline. And some of them actually went down. 
So it's clear that there was something going on here that we absolutely could not capture, that we could not capture. And I want to also point out, we left out of the score the size of the effect, safety issues, appropriateness of the control group, and many other factors. It was just meant to be capture the central issues which the FDA itself said were the uh, factors to be taken into account. So let me show you how this happened. So I'm going to take you through one, uh, just one case and, and, and then reflect on it. So this is a case of drox droxydopa or Northera. Condition, the condition is symptomatic neurogenic orthostatic hypotension, basically standing up and, and fainting. Uh, the designation was it was orphan drug and it was uh, considered under the accelerated approval uh, uh, paradigm. The original submission had a one pivotal study and one supportive study. Now you're gonna have to pay attention here for a second. So the primary endpoint in this pivotal study was dizziness, um, <clears throat> but this was changed during the study to uh, the orthostatic hypertension questionnaire score, which was a composite score. And both of them were actually statistically significant. Um, but the primary endpoint in the supportive study, so this is not formally two studies, this is just supportive, was not significant. So it was denied for a variety of reasons, and I'm only capturing so the top level was, first of all, they decided one positive study was not enough because the supportive study they said was not supportive. The effect was extremely small. This is a chronic disease, but they only used one week of follow-up. And there was a question about data from two sites in the Ukraine. It was, they made the statement it was not significant in the United States. So the, and the, the questionnaire endpoint was of questionable meaning and there were conflicting results. So the company appealed, sorry, uh, sorry. The company appealed and said, 20 years ago, you used a one week endpoint for a similar drug. So the FDA said, okay, they'll agree to the one week endpoint, but for the other reasons, the additional pivotal study is still needed. That study was done. And this one, the primary outcome changed during the study from, from the OHQ to patient reported falls, and then finally to dizziness. It was uh, statistically significant at P of 0.03, but only at one week in an eight week study. And you can see the overlap here. You can see the, the bigger difference at one week. And then basically there's complete overlap in all the su subsequent time points. The treatment groups were imbalanced due to a pretty big difference in differential dropout very early on. The clinical reviewer opposed approval due to weak evidence for a tiny short-term effect in a, in a chronic long-term disease, but it was favored by the advisory committee because of highlighting patient testimonies and its orphan disease status. In the office director's menu, memo, he said, there's no doubt that the data are quote unquote, at the margin for approvability but reasonably likely isn't tantamount to substantial evidence. And this is sort of the same issue, um, similar issue to aducanumab. If the desired efficacy were verified for every accelerated approval, we would know that we were setting the bar too high. So in other words, there's a recognized risk that some of these approvals will not pan out. So the very uncertainty that they had, he said, was within range. And so it was approved with a requirement for another study, just like with aducanumab. So what do you do with a result like that, where we thought we could bring sense to this area and we found, well, let me just comment uh, uh, on the, the study that we just talked about. The reasoning was not, it wasn't that it was so illogical. In fact, the reasoning within each of these cases, and we look very, very closely, you can often follow. But the problem is that you that the reasoning in different ones often is very, very different. And there's no linking of any of these decisions. So this is actually what led us to publish this paper, which just appeared a few months ago, where we had to take a step back and say, what's going on here? And what's going on well, I'll summarize in the next slide, which we realized actually that shows what's going on is that the FDA is making a series of bespoke decisions. 
each one delinked from the other. And while they sometimes have an internal logic, there's no structure and no system to guarantee that they use the same logic or standards or model their reasoning in one case based on another. And this is what we pointed out in this study. We had to take a few steps back and, th and think, how could this be happening that we couldn't find any sort of consistency across decisions? And here are some, uh, a, a few features I'll just highlight one or two new evidence submitted between cycles for 22 for seven of the 22 there was no new evidence it was approved with no new evidence they just changed their attitudes towards the evidence as you saw in that case they agreed to a one-week time point simply when they were reminded of a precedent or when the company argued um, and sometimes they would approve it even when they disagreed they just they approved it with unresolved issues you can't model that and in this, um, in this uh, uh, figure from the paper, I'm not going to go through all of these. These are many of the reasons that the denials occurred. But there's quite a few that were approved with unresolved issues, which is this last column. So it makes it almost impossible to model because they use different judgments sometimes across cycles of the same agent. And the other thing, well, I'll just read these up, summary observations. So summary, summary evidential characteristics, which has been the way the FDA uh, decisions have been analyzed, reveal little about the, their reasoning. This study enabled us to look at evidential requirements when all the facts and the context were held constant. As I said, it doesn't have an implicit or operational standard for defining substantial evidence when flexible criteria are used. Many decisions are changed without new evidence. Some decisions changed with a change in the division or apprising the FDA of its own past decisions or acceptance of previously rejected endpoints. No decisional memos referred to the reasoning used in any other decision and every decision invoked a bespoke rationale. It's also interesting to know we had to spend two years digging these things up and reading through them. The FDA has no structured database that allows them to retrieve prior decisions with similar evidential features or contexts. Just try finding um, all the decisions that use a, a, a surrogate endpoints. Very weak struct it has very weak structures to support institutional memory, particularly across divisions uh, or across therapeutic areas, and to develop a learning regulatory system which would, which would build on prior decisions. Now the legal world has a model. This is an example of a decision made uh, related on the theories of, uh, of vaccines causing autism. And uh, you will see in any legal decision, many, many, many references to prior decisions. There's case law. So the, the principles used, not the actual decisions, are applied consistently across the law. In aducanumab, in the, um, in the summary, you have there's no connection with any other decision that the FDA has ever made. And in the body of the decisions, there's not even references to the literature. They talk about um, uh, that, that this, the study was extremely persuasive um, in, the, in that the reduction of amyloid had an effect on the cognitive endpoint. But, but ignored or didn't refer to the huge body of evidence outside of this decision, which suggested that this is not a, that this, mod, this model doesn't hold. And it's actually a hypothesis that the um, advisory committee explicitly um, was told would not be used. And you see words like robust and exceptionally persuasive, interpretable and capable of providing evidence he feels that the results of the exploratory analysis contribute to an overall understanding. So there are these appeals to conviction, but not links to um, the logic and standards that the FDA has ever used before. Um, and that continues that. At the end of the uh, entire package, there's no, as I say, no external or internal references in any evidentiary or conclusionally assessment.
other than in the general advisory committee uh, background section. And interestingly enough, the, the uh, document title was uh, the PCNS, that's the advisory committee, combined FDA biogen backgrounder. This is extremely unusual. Usually there's an FDA presentation and a company presentation. So uh, aducanumab appeared to break with FDA precedent, which breeds distrust that it was driven by non-scientific factors. In fact, Janet Woodcock, who's the acting commissioner, disputed this. She said, and this is in the press, the difference here, I think, is accelerated approval has been used for small populations, and this is quite different. This is millions of people who suffer from Alzheimer's or pre-Alzheimer's, so it isn't lowering the standard. It's using the standard we use fairly frequently in other circumstances in a new circumstance. The problem with this is this is in stat news. It is not explained in the decision, and they don't refer to the other precedent. So obviously precedent is important to her, but it's nowhere in the FDA documents. A true precedential tradition is critical, as we've talked about, to protect the public's trust, um, which I believe was materially uh, um, uh, harmed by this decision. So I used this picture before. The question is, is this, does the road look like this with very few guideposts and everybody lost? Or does it look like this, uh, which has its own connotations as well? At least there's a clear path that's unclear to what. Um, but I would urge everybody here who has any thoughts about this to go to the CMS website and comment. This The comment period only lasts about another two weeks. And um, this decision uh, may not stand. Uh, you can also look at the submitted comments of many uh, dozens, maybe hundreds of people that have been submitted already before you submit your own. So I'm going to finish and thank you. And I hope we'll have a good discussion because I know I tossed a lot of stuff out of the, out there and not all of it is without controversy. So thank you very much.